Hello and welcome along to the second episode of this brand new coaching series from the Honest Football Podcast. I'm Daniel Cody and each week I'll be interviewing co-hosts Craig Savage and Charlie Betts about their roles in non-league football. Craig and Charlie work together as manager and coach respectively of a local football team currently playing in step 7 of the non-league football pyramid. In each episode I'll quiz them on a different approach and aspect to their work to give an insight into the diary and management of coaching in non-league football. So this week, after our initial general coaching episode, yeah. which if you haven't seen it yet, obviously go back and check that one out first to get you a bit of a background, mm -hmm. we're going to be focusing on training. Right. So we're going to talk about, from a coaching aspect, what training means to you generally, and we're also going to talk about the specific restrictions that can occur in the lower levels of non-league football, which I think is going to get a few entertaining oh, answers out of day. you. <laughs> and obviously I'm hoping later down the line we'll be able to expand this series mm. to coaches at different levels, and it'd be really interesting to see the differences between mm. the levels of football. So I'm going to start with a very simple question, and we'll start with the generic ones and then work towards the non-league ones towards the end. So the first part for both of you, obviously as manager and coach, what is your favourite part of training? Um, from a manager, well, going back to being a player to start with, I hated training, I'm not going to lie, I hated it. Um, and, and this is going to lead brilliantly onto a bit later as well. Um, well, um, what, from a manager point of view, I, I knew from the back end of last season, I thought I knew training had to need to improve. So. Obviously, I knew someone that would uh, make training fun for everyone. Obviously, oh, yeah. this is where I hired Charlie Betts as my, uh, Level my two coach. coach. We need to make that yeah. clear. He says hired. I haven't received any financial gain <laughs> from this, so I think hired would be a wrong term. If you're getting that. paid, then that's more than me. No, I'm joking. Um, I'm joking. So I knew training would be fun. And obviously, now I've, um, from the manager's point of view, I, I, what I get excited about people, uh, training is seeing players I can see improve. Yeah. Over time, um, and obviously coming from, starting from the first training session, which obviously in pre-season, to where we are now today, uh, there has been an improvement. And I would say the same from watching, is to be honest. And then, uh, for me as well, I, I get to join in on the training. Yeah, yeah. I, I enjoy that now, and then because I can just talk to my player and reminisce. And yeah, I used to be good back in the day. Well, I think for you as well, if you know what I'm saying, there's there's a re this season, and it, I'm sure that this happens at loads of other grassroots clubs, there is a realistic possibility that you might have to put a kit on and play. So in some ways, keeping your toe in, for want of a better phrase, is probably not the worst plan to go forward. No, I'm keeping myself fit. I, take I, this weekend, I mean, uh, you know, as we're recording, the game's unlikely to be on due to weather, but we're struggling for a back four. There is a possibility that you might have to kit up. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? It's that sort of thing. So to suddenly go from not playing to... So maybe keeping into training as a manager, you get to see a different side of the players. It's probably something that is going to be unique to the level we're going to talk about yeah. most of this episode, where you probably won't see that at the top end of the Premier League. No, because no, no. the manager's not going to have to worry about what if I need to play, or yeah. am I going to have enough players for the session I want to do and things like yeah. that, which we'll obviously get on to. But for you, Charlie, what's the best part of coaching players? Um... I think when Craig mentioned it about progress, but it, it's it's seeing for me. I think you don't see the fruits of your labour in, in in a training session. You know, quite often you you dob off at people. You end up, you know, you've got to do this. Can you try that? Can you go there? It's in a game that you see it. Um, so I I take it as one of the first sessions we did, as well as the pre-season element, was about a, like a, a when to press, when not to press. We've done a recap on it recently, but that was one of the first sessions. And in a game, what four games in five, even six games into the season, we played a particular fixture where it worked really really well. So you don't really see it straight away. So I think it's the favourite part of training is see actually seeing the fruits of it later on. Quite often I come away from training thinking that was crap, that was awful. But then you get to the match day and you actually think, oh, actually, they did take it. In yeah, yeah. Final. So I, I, I think that it, it, there is obviously satisfaction that if you try and do something and it comes off, there's sometimes a, <laughs> I do have quite a characteristic skip if something goes well. He does the well. David Pleat I do a, a David Pleat you know, if something works because I do... It, quite rare to be honest, but no. Um, it's There is that. So yeah, I think for, for me, I think it is... It's important. That that comes from, if I'm honest, um, as a player, I got used to get so frustrated. I, I actually quite enjoyed training, as long as it was worthwhile training. If it was something that was going to improve me or improve the team, Completely agree. I hated going to training sessions. And this is not, I'm not, you know, because it isn't easy for everyone. Where you just go and play five aside, and I sort of feel like I'm giving up my evening. I'm not saying I'm this important person, but you know what I mean. We all ten minute like warm up, ten minute shooting practice, half an hour five aside. Yeah, up. and you sort of feel, is this worthwhile? What am I getting from this? So. That's where a lot of my inspiration for training comes from, in the sense of I think my favourite part is actually doing stuff that's worthwhile, and then you can you can see some sort of fruit from later on. So yes, yeah. fantastic. And then obviously I have to ask you the flip side of that: what do you find generally to be the worst part of training in each of you? I'll, I'll go first in this one if you don't mind. Go for it. Logistics. I, I you know, getting the, the people. And there. again, this is largely a non-league thing as well. Yeah, having the, the space that you're meant to have or not meant to have, not knowing if you've got the, the certain number there, not knowing if you're going to have a half a pitch, a third of a pitch. 
not knowing. It actually maybe the logistics is the wrong word. It's the fear of the unknown. Whereas I know that if you go to a football league club, you know, with the exception of injuries, you know roughly how many lads you're going to have. You know exactly what space because you can determine. Yeah, you've that. always got an academy squad. You can get two people to fill if in you want to. Or whatever, yeah. yeah, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, for for me, the bit I dislike the most is the unknown, the unknown element. Not of knowing if you can do what you want to do. Yeah, essentially, I have to go to the stage now, and, and you know I've shown this to Craig. I have to plan two, maybe even three sessions every Tuesday for three different possible outcomes. So and, know, and that's a really interesting point. It's actually one of my questions later on, so I'm going to pressure on that a bit later on as well. Um, yeah. I want to ask you, Craig, as well. What's the worst part for you? Because you have you, you you have to do the other side of training, which is quite interesting. Yeah, it's just um, just making sure everyone's there, and then. I think from a reserve point of view is... And that, that's the thing I probably didn't mention yeah. at the start of this episode, it's, it's a reserve team. It's, it's a, it's a reserve added team. element a lot so of grass. Sort of between under-18s and, and first yeah, it's, it's, it, it always feels like the middle ground anyway um, with the reserves, but obviously the first team train on a different day, um, which is sometimes not ideal because obviously you want your playing players to progress even what they like with first team players well pre-season but, was good because we trained on the same night didn't yes. we since you obviously have to rely on floodlights and yeah. obviously, because pitches. obviously um, the club we're at is a big club quite a big youth set up obviously people need their time to train as well but mm. for us we're averaging about 16 18 players every week on a Tuesday night which is, for well, me is actually getting closer to 20 yeah, it's getting yeah. up, up to 20 for me that's fantastic but obviously as Charlie said we're limited on space it's accommodating that that's yeah. a big pain if I'm honest um we had, a, we had a problem um, midweek with just a bit of lack of communication with us and the first team where first team management have said to their players if you need fitness go and train in reserves the only problem is with that we didn't get told <laughs> and that, <laughs> that would have resulted in and this is not being an egotistical thing but that would have resulted in me with 25 lads in one third of a pitch you, you can't do anything of anything of any worth and anyway. it's more for, for checking are you even doing a fitness yeah. based session yeah. You might be doing set pieces, in which case you're going to be standing still. Half exactly. Time. Well, that was the thing. To be honest, the whole the whole session was about you know getting the ball into wide areas and then capitalising on that. And actually, you have got too many lads for that. It's just people just stood around and it's freezing cold. You know, we're in what end of November nearly now. So, so yeah. So I'm jumping on your answer, Craig. Sorry, but it's uh, yeah. Um, I want to move on to the next one, which is probably the most generic question of the lot, which is how would you each explain from what you've done so far your coaching style? You, I, I, oh, I well. Um, no, because you, you know, you, I think you go first. I, I think I can see a style in you, but you go first. Please. I think my style is if I see something that I think is wrong, then I will. I, I wouldn't pull. It, I won't pull them to the side, but I'll, I'll talk to them about it. Mm. Um, I won't be like strong. I won't. I won't shout in their faces because what's shouting going to do in front of someone? They're just going to mm. get more annoyed. And um, like for example, um, I know you've not got to do occasion, but like a few weeks ago, one of our players had a massive drop over something during a game and then he kicked the ball away and I, I said at the end of the session I said look you've got 30 seconds to me, me and you privately we'll have a chat what's wrong mm. and he was like no I don't want to I was like well there you go you lost your 30 seconds in the <laughs> end he pulled me to the side and told me what his problem was um, and he felt a lot better after speaking I said you had 30 mm. seconds to vent and obviously he told me what his problem was and now he felt so much better and I said look with your stress release so it's quite an interesting dynamic the two of you have made because Charlie seems from what I've seen, heard and seen of you two as doing the general I guess team coaching yeah, yeah. and then you're more focused on I'm A the man management and B the pulling one person yeah, to the side working on one thing or something like you, that you've hit the nail that's literally what I was going to say I think is, is what Craig which is great for you as a manager having a coach like Charlie because you can then spot those things afford, can't you? you can afford to give up the time to do that yeah. as well you know it's hard to if you're running a session of 18 blokes it's hard for me to personally to stop and go right actually in that situation and while the rest of the session's going on which is where he comes in and that's that's fantastic. yeah it's like I think another example is like um, one, one uh, I said Charlie was doing the crossing session and one player did the cross and what happened is the, um, the right back behind him was doing an overlap and then the guy passed it to the right back and I said you don't have to pass Ooh. it to the right back Let, the, if you, the right back creates the overlap and run use that him as a decoy because mm. the defender's going to think right I'm going to actually go, and go with the defender which creates an open, yeah. open space and he can get space to cross it in Mm. And he didn't think like that at first. He was like, oh, if I just give it to him, then that's my job done. But like, no, it's a bit like that. But the thing does have to be done. You, if you, you're you're a winger basically. You, wingers, I expect wingers to cross the ball. Yeah, I think what that comes comes down to, and I'm going to have a slight tangent, but I think this is where it comes into my sort of coaching style. If you don't want me going on to that, is that the teaching background I come from is the using and applying. So we've done a session on a two v one scenario, so that's where the overlap comes from. 
and it's 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 almost like when you work with kids it's like saying right i know that i haven't specifically told you to do that but four weeks ago we did a session on 2v1s where you've isolated the fullback so what did we do in that session why can't you do that there without me having to tell you to do that if that makes sense so if you can, responsibility on exactly so if you can see so for example if you can see he's overlapping why can't you drive inside instead you know that kind of thing yeah. but without us having to tell it so I think for me, I probably come from a teaching background, so mine is very much building blocks of, right, we've done this. I'm not saying we've nailed it, because you know we've done pre pressing a few times in sessions, but there's a foundation that we've built early on in pre-season. Now we're gonna build up that way. Okay, maybe we need to go in this direction, but we already know how to drop deep and deal with the long ball. So when I come to do this next session about winning the second ball, for example, or sorry, anticipating the second ball, I don't need to cover when to drop, because you've already done that. So I think it's, but sometimes that's not always easy because of the turnover of the lads, some lads coming in, coming out. So that's yeah, yeah, I think that's the, that's, neg that's, that's the negative to the my approach. Yeah. The yeah, it's it's hard, like, for example, one week we had some players, some of our reserve players play for the first team in our cup game. Mm. And then obviously you live in that, and then we work on something, and then we get to the weekend, we do pretty much that, but not score. And then some of the player that weren't there during the week, who was playing with the first team, goes, why don't we try practice that in training? Well, we did. It's probably <laughs> you've probably highlighted something that'll actually be discussed in the next one when we talk about tactics, which is something I find really unique at your club, which is that the teams going through don't play the same way. Yeah, because normally yeah. they all build towards mm, the same no, tactic. But yeah, that's but, something um, I find quite weird. There. That's because I, we did speak about that in uh, before pre-season. We speak about it's like well, what I think we 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 went up to the first team and was like what where what are you playing? Yeah. What position? What formation are you playing? And um, we'll try and copy that. I've but got, then. I think with the players that we have compared to the players they have, we have to change your I, I think as well, and I've got to be very careful with politically the way I word this. I, the first team have got a very good team and they have very good players. If you ask them what I, their identity is, I don't think they could tell you. So then we can't mirror that because if I'm honest, they're a cracking team, but they're very reliant on players who played at a very high level before. And just sort of generally, and I'm not saying they're not doing a bad job because obviously they're doing a very good job because they're playing at that level. I think if you were to say what's your DNA of the club, they haven't got one. So you're trying more trying to create one for the teams. Essentially, yeah. Future. So I was, you're taking, I guess, more players from the 18s, aren't you? Yeah. So I would say there's probably a bit more of a link between us and the 18s. As I say, I think it's hard with time. I would like to do a bit more of the 18s. So then there is that link between the two. Obviously, you know, life doesn't always afford you that amount of time Absolutely. to do that. So, but I think that there's lads who come through the 18s who who've trained with us are starting to get the picture of what we're trying to do the problem is then if they go to the first team are they going to get that same experience uh, who knows you know I don't know and now I'm going to move on to the last general question before we get into the non-league specifics and probably the, the hardest question of the night if there's one that's going to cause yeah. me tension it'll be this no. one um, Craig, there's, there's always one question <laughs> questions for no, you Craig honest, we've, we've mentioned that uh, Charlie's doing a lot of the general team coaching for you mm -hmm. um, describe Charlie's sessions describe a Charlie coaching session um, See how much attention he's paid now, isn't he? Yeah. No, no, I'm joking. No, <laughs> you no, can no, cut no. it with a knife. No, no, I'm joking. No, no, I think the sessions are fun. I generally do. Um, I think that I think that very detailed. And and to be honest, we pla we do discuss like, what yeah, should yeah. we do after after a game on like probably sat uh, like late Saturday or Sunday. So I think we should work on this. Yeah. Um, yeah, and plus it gets everyone involved. It, it, first, but a part of it, we have a laugh. I think that um, that get just gets people going. Get More of a revival activity. Yeah, yeah, just just to get everyone vibes up and have a little bit of banter, and then obviously then we take it seriously, and then we we'll get to like we we'll get to a little bit of a game mm. at the end, and we'll turn up in it, and depending on numbers, if it's odd, then yeah. obviously I'll play. But um, I, I think they're very detailed, and I think that's what you want from a training session. I, I, if you, you've got to have these sort of details to for it to uh, establish into a game. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't mean to be unfair on any predecessors or people who have been at that club before, because obviously I've watched fixtures before. But it's very, it's very clear that Charlie has detail in his sessions, uh, particularly from the games I've watched. Is that's quite rare at that level of football? Yeah, mm. we, we um, obviously the game we had previously, uh, Charlie wasn't there because he was ill at the time. Very, um, very ill at the time. <laughs> no, it was, and it was we, just man flu. <laughs> it was honestly. But we, we lost the game. Um, we played. We played well. We, it was just two mistakes really. Um, mm. We just couldn't score as well. But uh, and we said at the end of the game, we said, "Look, what Charlie's done is got us playing in a certain way. It's it's working." And, and just unfortunately for today, we just couldn't score. Mm. Uh, and it's just two simple mistakes. And it's adapts into a young side again, yeah, isn't it? It's mm. Two simple mistakes. So we're on the right track. It's just. 
Mm. We just, from us as a team, I think we need to get over that. I mean, it's been like the last few seasons. We just need to get over this mental block at the moment, and just someone's got to take take a hit, the scruff the neck, mm. and not just think, I'm gonna, um, oh, it's right, that player's gonna take the game, but you've got you've got to think, I'm gonna take this game, mm. the scruff neck, and hopefully they're thinking the same thing. I'm gonna take this game, the scruff neck, and then you get eight, nine, ten players all taking this game putting their bodies on the line for it I guess that's building a confidence and identity to do mm. it isn't it Which yeah is I, 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 I generally think that I said I don't, you can't rely on you, most teams you cannot rely on um, a certain player alright Barcelona and Juventus you can rely on Messi and Ronaldo mm. but they're, they're playing at the very top for a certain reason they're, they're also, we're playing quite low local football and you've got such a high turnover of players, which yeah, you yeah. So you're not you're necessarily like, going to have the one you rely on. No, because obviously not. players are obviously no. got some players have to work, and obviously you have to deal with that. That's that's mm. non-league football for you. Yeah. Obviously, if you've got to work, work takes priority over football. Absolutely, you're only living in the day. But it's literally just taking that taking that um, game by the scruff of the neck, and mm. you've got to build on that. Well, it's, it's really good for me to actually see the football understanding as well, which is something perhaps playing just sort of as a laugh. Some of the football and things are undervalued, mm. in you? Because like, even there, where you talked before about we were working in the last session about getting the ball to wide areas and taking advantage, two weeks ago when I came to watch you, that's the first thing I noticed, that mm. you weren't taking advantage of the wide areas yeah. you were in. And see then a week and a half later you're working like that, that takes understanding and taking yeah. in the game, which a lot of, a lot of coaches don't do because they're too busy shouting at the referee, for example. <laughs> that's very kind of you, but yeah, no, I don't know. Um, so obviously we've covered most of the generals of coaching now, and we're going to mention a thing that you've obviously brought up a couple of times already, and it so heavily influences mm. the coaching at the level you are, is what do you find to be generally the restrictions being in the English non-league in particular, yeah. and what do you find most difficult about it? I think it's, I know I mentioned logistics earlier, it is, you know, you can't help people being at work, you can't help people... Etc. I think it's a time of this time of year when we're recording November, December. I think from a coaching perspective is a nightmare because people are having to do a bit of extra work. It's coming up to Christmas. You know, we're relying on space for I don't know how many hundreds of teams there are in this area. Basically, trying to get onto seven Astro turf pitches or whatever. I, mean, I think it's only like six or seven, isn't there in the town? Uh, in the town, Luton. Yeah, probably, no, probably not even that. So you know, you rely on that. We're you know. Clubs have overheads, so the pitch that we use, you obviously have to hire. Ideally, you'd think we're one of the Saturday senior teams. We would be, and I'm not saying this is the case, but there'd be a lot of other areas where maybe they would get priority and you'd be able to half a pitch. But I understand the club has, has overheads, so therefore they need to sell the pitches. You know, So we, we're training with, there's another like teenage team, then there's another adult team at the bottom, who have nothing to do with the club, but at the end of the day, they're, they're going to pay how many pounds a week and clubs need Probably that fund to, your to team, yeah. exactly to basically fund our lads who don't pay subs for example so it's that kind of thing so then when you've got that many lads in a third of a pitch it's like right what can I do they've given up their evening I need to put on something that's worthwhile for them being here but also develops the team in a positive way and there is there is a pressure to that there's the thing of, of um, and this is not a reflection on them but younger lads not necessarily being the most uh communicative when it comes to am I going to be late am I going to be there at all or you know what I mean can my mate come along I mean we've had some lessons and I know they mean in the politest way possible but we've had some lessons bring a mate which is fine but that's an extra body to try and take care of and just someone else who might get in the way when you've got a small area as it is so I guess equally with the life situations as well a lot of the people you're going to be dealing with are going to be new to the working world as well yeah and equally, they don't know with their boss, can I get away with going and saying, I'm going to be late for training or I've got to work late or things like yeah. that. Do they have that confidence to do that as well? Exactly. So I, I think from, from my perspective, I think the hurdles are a finan- uh, sorry, a, a spatial res- restriction due to a financial restraint on so many non-league clubs who are operating at a loss, most of them. Yeah. You know, and that impact, and that, and it's not the impact on a match day, it's the impact on a Tuesday night when you've got 20 lads in a third of a pitch. That's that's the impact Which of... then, if it happens for a prolonged period, then has the effect on the match day. Exactly, yeah. So that's... Yeah. Anything you disagree with there, Craig? Do you have any no, more to No, no, I think it's spot on. Like, it, I do get frustrated when it's just a third. I'm not going to lie. And we, we've been begging for it, um, for more. And we we did discuss this over the summer. We, we trained at the same time with the first team and, and then we'll hire out the whole pitch for the hour. Yeah. Um, but... S- somebody made a, me- uh, a cock up with mm. scheduling and and also it's an extra bit of money then if they do hire out someone else so and they're all, they're all things that happen in amateur sport I yeah and it's, it's yeah. you have to obviously we're not going to get like ha- things handled on a plate but we just have to unfortunately we just have to d- get on with it and obviously 
I don't really like training on the 3G most times. Even the young ones nowadays think, oh, it's best to play on the 3G because that's what they're growing up to. But, to but do. I guess at that level, there's no alternative in Windows. No, no, no. No, no, no it's not. Just, you, you made that argument, and I, I, I'm not saying I completely agree with it, but it's, it's times like this where I, I would say actually maybe a summer sport, sorry, a summer league would be a better way forward. From from that perspective, if you're talking about, but then equally the club are probably relying on finance from cricket in the summer. Exactly, yeah. that's true. Yeah, pitch. yeah, and actually people then wouldn't hire a plastic pitch because they don't need to because they're playing for the summer, so then they're losing out that way. So yeah, I get I get why it is like that. From my perspective, in the utopian football world. We'd be in Spain where it never, where weather's not like that anyway. So you could get away with it all year. And I know it's because of talking about space, but you actually led me on to the last, next question well. And it was it was more related to the the number changes for a session. Mm. Something you mentioned already is a two part really. How do you deal with vast number yeah. changes before a session? And you've already said you do plan for more than one session before it. Is how do you go about planning for two different sessions? Do you think? Well, this one's if we've got 10 or less. Yeah. This one's if we've got 15 or more, you know, things like that. I think it's more like... Sorry. No, go on. No, I, no, think no. It's, I think what he does is, one, do we have the space? Yeah. <laughs> if, we, if somehow another team don't bother to turn up one week, do we get half the pitch? Or, or uh, do we plan for a third of a pitch? And then I think then we rely on the numbers of how many players we're getting. Um, but I said, I think from a player point of view, obviously our numbers have been fantastic. Yeah. Um, and not many players have... Not message me so I can't make training. No, 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 no. But um, I think when you, it's I think you have to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you know the 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 re- that stemmed from when it was during the preseason it was fine because we had a big old field we could use and there wasn't really an issue. It's not really that. a problem for teams in the summer, is it? Because no, you're no. training on a grass pitch in the middle of you know. But Even we, we did we have usually, some problems. <laughs> we, we usually had a third of a pitch, and then there was one week we had half a pitch, and it caught me on the hop, and I was like, shit, right, I don't really know what to do. So then the session I delivered was awful. There wasn't really much in the way of progress, but I felt I had to do this right. I have to do this big game sort of thing. And what I should have done, and I should notice as a teacher, I should have stuck to the plan and maybe just made everything a little bit bigger. But I sort of thought, right, well, let's make the most of having half a pitch because we don't normally get half a pitch. And it was from then I thought, right, I have to be diligent enough to know, right, this is what we want to achieve. This wants to be our overall objective for that session. This is route A, which we've got third of a pitch. And, you know, we might have to, you know, one week recently where we actually didn't have enough space to do it. So we had two groups doing the activity, then the third group actually, and this was, it wasn't ideal, but Sav had to go and do a bit of fitness work with some of them, and then we'll just rotate it around. So there's that, and then on the flip side of it is, right, if we have a big area, how else do we achieve that objective? And that's sort of pathway B almost. But it is, I mean, the start of a session, start of my session is generally would follow, whether it's a small pitch or a big one, which is what skill are we looking at? Is it, you know, a particular type of, is it a, how to hold up someone? Is it when to press, when not to press? So and that, that tends that's to be- That's the key for me. So. Both, if you're planning the two sessions based yeah. on the size, you're going to have the amount of people or the space. Yeah, they're both for the same objective. Yeah, yeah, always. So, yeah, yeah as, as best we can. So the session tends to be that's the skill we're going to work on. And I know this comes from a teacher. And you work around that. Though. And then after that, you know, you've got to apply that to some sort of game-based situation or some sort of competitive situation to the life throat. Now, is that in a small area here where we do it this way, or is it in a much bigger area here where we can afford to do it that way? And then it's the final stages and applying it to an actual game um, scenario, you know, because there's no point doing all of that if you wanted to do a few weeks ago, we did about playing out from sort of tight areas and pressing together as a team. There's no point doing that in different boxes because you don't do it in boxes on a pitch. You've got to take that into some sort of yeah. game environment for it to put all due respect to some of the players for them to understand why you've been doing it. So, yeah, that that's the thing, whether it's small or big, it's then how do you tr- do that, really? I quite a lot of the insight from both of you on that one. There was a few surprises in there for me. Oh, right. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So, the last team one, and I've got a couple of individual player ones. So, in terms of the team, how do you, as a team, and it's something unique Mm. to this situation because I've got the manager and the coach here, Mm. is how do you agree and arrange which coaching areas or which specific objectives Mm. you're going to work on in such a limited time? So, obviously, you've only got an hour session. You've normally only got two days between the match and the day. Yeah. Then you're training. How do you agree what you're going to work on? If you don't mean saying, to be honest, for them, they give me the theme and then I go off. And it's not, and it's not that, it's not I think it's more, 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 more on the, uh, I think, when he hasn't been there. Yeah, particularly more so if I've been there. If he's, uh, obviously, when he has been there, um, he, he will know straight away to, what to work on. And, and, and he, he will ask, do you think there's anything else? And then we'll, we'll say anything. Yeah. Him, but I suppose there's a slight onus more. I think that's probably where my main responsibility is, is, is identifying what, 
can we work from on there? But we do obviously have a conversation about that. Conversation How we do that, in, not in a disrespectful way, it's probably no point me showing it to them until our, after I planned all of it because there's no, you know, what would you do in that situation? That's not why yeah. I'm there, therefore, and that's not, I'm not there then to pick a team, really. I have a bit of an input, but I'm not there. I, ultimately, team selection, you know, who's doing what, that's that's their job, and I try not to interfere in that. In the same way, they don't really interfere with how are you going to achieve that objective. I think there's been, I wouldn't say we've ever disagreed on anything, there, there seems to be one theme that keeps popping up from one of them I'm not going to name names or who's saying what but it, there's something that keeps coming up which I do find slightly irrelevant to what's happened on the pitch um, so I've tried to ignore that as best I can and it does sometimes um, come up again every now and then um, I think if, if, if we had more time and obviously we're a bit more professional then yeah we can obviously we can work on everything but we can't yeah. we've only got an hour every week and it's what's the most pressing thing and that's it How that's how you agree that is the most important thing so is it is it more, I guess, based on that then, Craig or the management team yeah. coming up with a with a, a general idea of the areas they are unhappy or can see improvement, and then Charlie finding the best way to get there? The yeah, except, I think that's probably the best way of putting yeah. it. I, I, it's, it's difficult to not become panic stations just because you're letting two goals. Does that mean, right, we need to do a whole session on our back Cause, four? Because that's not necessarily always the case. You know, Newsflash so. to shouting coaches out there. How much players are going to make mistakes? Yeah, exactly. Of course, exactly. of course. Yeah. Like, Particularly youngsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, like, uh, and you have to work with them. Some players might react in like they might put that, they have their heads down, and some players might get in a strop. But at the end of the day, you're, we're all here to set, have the same. Adjustment. I think so. As an example, a few weeks ago, the reason we did the, the pre- pressing session was there was there was a game where we it looked like it was the back four who maybe were at fault, but actually, I think we took a step back and saw that we were pressing in groups, and it was very disjointed. There was no sort of um, unity about the way we were yeah. doing it. So actually, to them, to the players, it's a bit like, well, why are we doing this? Because you know those four back there can, can control what they were doing. But actually, we could see that it was a much, but it was a problem much further up the pitch throughout the whole side. So sometimes it's hard to convince the the players that actually the reason you were doing that is because of A, B, C, because they only see the mistake or they only see that, and it's trying not to get um, people to panic about that. You yeah. know. So yeah, I think yeah. I think the problem is obviously we're obviously non league now, but. We don't get to record games. We can't give them proof, show them no. proof of why we we're doing this. And obviously, if we show them proof, of, yeah, you didn't, you were here, and then this person was here, and it, it's always fun when you have to mark it on a whiteboard and you get the little mm-hmm. little miniature thing or like all eighty proof we the Sabutio stuff. We can't actually show them, so we you have to go with our word basically. Mm-hmm. And equally, they're trusting your memory basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. That is a good point. Whether we can, we can. I so if we we recorded a game. Um, we can show it right yeah this you were here but then this person if you yeah, tell them to come across and that and then they are like oh yeah okay you're fine I can see it like really good again a non-league problem which is yeah. what we're well, so some for. teams do record some teams don't but obviously we don't have a oh, media man possible. and you're, we're, we're talking we're step seven now, yeah. So yeah it's a lot more difficult on to the two player ones and then we'll wrap it up with one final question uh, how willing are amateur players dealing with the boring side of the game so obviously a lot of your objections yeah. as you say you make them fun there are some things, so mm. certain bits of fitness work and preseason that that are boring, notoriously. Yeah. How do you deal with amateur players? How do you keep them engaged? And how do you deal? I guess leading on to the next question as well, with negativity surrounding that. Yeah. Um, I try to laugh it off. Not gonna lie, you gotta yeah. joke about it because if they think you can't let them get the better of you. Yeah, I, I think I I mentioned it in week one. I think you. This is gonna sound horrible. You have to lie to them in the spe- in the sense that. If a footballer thinks they're contributing to something, whether they actually are or not, that will get them on side. So if it seems boring, I always try and say it as, well, well, you lads, I won't name names, but some of you have individually spoke to me saying we need to work on this. So, you know, I'm, you know, I know they, they haven't. They haven't mentioned it to me. They've never spoken to me or Craig about whatever issue it is we're trying to address. But it's just trying to get a bit of unity as if it's not... The last thing you want, in my opinion, in, in footballers nowadays, at any level, amateurs up to Premier League is a dictatorship. Those days are gone. It's it's That's a thing of the past. So it's trying to get everyone to buy into that. And that's what you need from them is buy-in. And I think, you know, I mentioned it before, but I've read a few books like Clive Woodward, etc. And, and the way to get people to engage in stuff is for them to feel like they've created it, they've, they've designed that. The reality is, have they? No. And I know it sounds horrible, but... If they think they have, they're a lot more likely to engage with it. Does that solve the problem? No, but does it make it a little bit easier? Yeah, and I think from my teaching background, and I don't mean this in a patronising way, you know who the ringleaders are, you know who the ones you need to get on side. If you get them on, 
I won't name names. There's a player in our team who in pre-season was a nightmare. Hated training, etc. Quite often, he wouldn't do anything special, but you try and make him feel loved. You try and make... Once he's on side, four or five other lads then you've already got with you as well. So I think it, it's trying to identify that. You know. And Craig, I guess as the manager, the, the side of the question for you more is dealing with negativity yeah. in terms of individual incidences, throwing toys at the pram and yeah. things like that. So where does that come into play for you? Um, I, I, I wouldn't do it in front of... I think it's always best to leave it to the side. You don't really want to do it in front of everyone else. Take their crowd away. Take their yeah, it takes, it, takes, it takes the heat away from everyone else. Yeah. Um, so you put them to, I, I like to put them to the side and just let them... I said the same the player earlier. Just let them bend and then mm. let's, let's have a discussion about it. In the day, you might be right, but I'm the one that makes mm. me and my uh, joint manager. We're making the decision at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it sounds like we've got the answers. I think that's something personally I need to work on is that side of it. I think Craig's man management is a lot, lot better than mine. I feel like if someone's not pulling their weight, then you find it hard not to get frustrated. But yeah, get, they, don't, they don't deserve to be and then, you know, we've got an under you can pick from, which is not the right attitude. You know, you need to stick with these lads and that's something that I, I struggle with and something that I definitely need to work harder on. Um, you know, there was a little bit of a tiff with a player recently over something and... I just sort of was like, I can't lose face over this. I have to remain in control of the situation. He then got the hump a bit more, you know, that sort of thing. So as much as I said about getting buy-in, I don't, it's not, I'm not perfect at it by any stretch, but I do think that the times it's been successful is when it's doing like that. But you know, it's like sometimes in the same way for the players, you've had a long day at work, you're feeling like crap or you're knackered or whatever. Uh, I've been dealing with been squabbling kids all day and you get someone who, in my opinion, at the time is trying to wobbly over something unnecessary. It's hard to not go, do you know what, Lynn? Off. You, know, you know in the polite way possible Again, so unique to semi-professional and amateur football yeah so I think in that sense that's definitely something if I was to develop that we're ha- we, we definitely haven't got the answers in that all of the answers sorry but I think that's the way forward it's fair enough it's nice for you both to highlight weaknesses as well it's appreciated and then a the last question for me and it's the easiest one but probably the hardest one to answer which is sum up what coaching means to both of you and more importantly leading on from that what would you like your legacy to be so if you ask people what was his coaching like? What? How was he as a coach? How would you like to feel? What would you like your legacy to be as a coach? Um, as a coach, well, obviously, well, if people don't know, I don't actually have. <laughs> I don't have any badges. But you, sometimes you don't need to have a badge, of, um, to obviously do that sort of coaching. But no, but like, I think it's more because I'm still feel at times I still feel like a player. Um. And, and if it wasn't for injuries, let's let's get this out of the room. You probably would still be a player, won't you? Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. And I think it's it's better to have that experience of being on both sides of the fe- of the um, of the yeah. fence. So um, that's how I feel like. For me, like I think, oh, I want them to think, oh, he was a great player. Let's go and listen to him and see what he thinks. He knows the club. He knows how to play at this sort of level. He's got the experience, um, and obviously. I want that for, for me, for, obviously for Charlie, is, is, is a hard work, dedicated and detailed sessions and just making sure that they improve as a player. Whatever they get, and obviously my aim is for, mm. my, is for my players, is to, is to get reached the first team. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do I feel that like we're successful so far? Probably not. Um, I think, I it's, I think, it's, I think yeah. it's, I think it's hard because at the time of recording, uh, obviously first team games are playing the same time as us and they haven't, we don't have big week games and it's harder obviously for them to come see us it's something that we'll get onto obviously in future episodes but a lot of clubs at that sort of level where they have a first team and a reserve mm. team they always play at the same time yeah, yeah it's yeah. a very difficult it is thing a challenge. it is a challenge for that pathway but I think if you don't want me going on for a little bit go on. <coughs> on this one <coughs> I think if you want me to it's a you're you're well thought of in the club and you played you know the highest level for that club and I think you inspire by example, um, and I think that's a fantastic uh, trait, and it's something that I wish that I I had, in the sense of even in training sessions now, you could still stand out and be one of the best players there. And I'm not saying that because you're my mate, but it just in terms of if you put your mind to it, that could easily happen. Whereas Charlie's the expert at asking, how do I get a transfer? No, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I get. A move I'm, not gonna, I'm not good at that, mate. <laughs> no, 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 no. But the the principle for me was I used to play for the club. I I didn't leave on the as a player. I didn't leave on the best of terms. So for me, my drive is I feel like I have to prove that. Although, okay, maybe, you know, because I played with some of the lads that I'm now coaching. So although they might think, okay, maybe left in slightly under a cloud or whatever the story was, and there's no need to go into that. But 
I feel like for me, my drugs, I have to prove that I am a better coach than I was a player, if that makes sense. Whereas you could probably get away with always being a better player. I'm not, this not take away from you as a coach or a manager, but you played at such a good level and have achieved so much for that club that no matter what happens, really, you're fairly safe. Although I played for the club, I didn't achieve the same things as him. So for me, I have to leave that legacy of he was an okay player or, you know, he was a bit of a dick when he played or whatever. But as a coach, he was honest and that he um, helped progress us in such a way that it was, it was, uh, it developed us as a team better. I think it was worthwhile, not that it was worthwhile going to the sessions. I think that I'd like that to be the, is it epitaph, is that the word, whatever it is. You know, that it was worth, if whenever I, you know, stopped coaching or whatever, it was worthwhile going to the sessions. And for me, that would be enough that if they thought it was worthwhile coming, got something out of it, and then went home. And we've all been a player, and that's probably the greatest value we can all take from this yeah. session, which is great. So thank you both, Craig Savage, Charlie Betts, for joining me for the second in this series. Thank you. And our first specific one where we focused on training. Uh, if you did enjoy the video on YouTube, like, share, and subscribe. On Spotify, follow for more videos from this series. And the next one will be on tactics. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter at Honest Football Free. And we'll see you next time.